Let's move to our panel on new ideas and regulation from the U.S. perspective. We're super lucky to have the Honorable Hester Peirce, a commissioner at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Professor William All from California Western School of Law. Hester Peirce was appointed by President Donald J. Trump to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and sworn in on January 11th, 2018. Prior to joining the SEC, Commissioner Peirce conducted research on the regulation of financial markets at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. She was senior counsel on the U.S. Senate Banking, uh, Housing and Urban Affairs Committee, where she advised ranking member Richard Shelby and other members of the Committee on Securities Issues. She has served as counsel to Commissioner Paul S. Atkins and worked as a staff attorney in the SEC's Division of Investment Management. She's been renominated as a commissioner for a five-year period, and uh, we're super lucky, as I said, to have her. Now, she was with us uh, at San Francisco Blockchain Week for a fireside chat back in October of 2019, which seems like a lifetime ago, and we're further now along the path in developing some legal uh, certainty, partly thanks to Commissioner Purse's proposed Rule 195, that provides a three-year safe haven for cryptocurrencies under circum, uh, certain circumstances. And this is a much-needed start to an, and a much uh, more updated approach to cryptocurrency regulation and will assist companies in capital formation while still protecting the general public and investors at large. Some of the other issues that uh, Commissioner Peirce and the SEC will be grappling with in the coming year include the adoption of uh, the need to maintain real-time transparency to public markets and how to address the long-standing SEC blockade on Bitcoin exchange fund uh, traded funds in a fast-changing uh, world. She will also uh, lead the charge, uh, Commissioner Peirce will, in reg- keeping reg- regulatory and transaction costs for capital formation in the U.S. at or near minimum so as to maintain the U.S competitive stance with other jurisdictions that are embracing cryptocurrencies. As we all know, uh, Commissioner Peirce has been a long advocate for uh, making sure that the U.S. is a country where information of capital is paramount, as as well as the protection of uh, Main Street investors. Without further ado, we move to the fireside chat. Commissioner Peirce, on behalf of Unitize, we want to thank you for your taking the time to attend and provide your good presence in the Unitize program here this year. And I also want to, on behalf of Unitize, to congratulate you on your renomination as a member of the Commission. An outstanding accomplishment. Well, thank you so much for the chance to be here. It's, it's a real honor to be here, and thank you for the congratulations. Of course, it's just the first step. Um, the Senate has to consider my nomination, and, and so um, if it moves forward, I, I would be honored to serve another term. Marvelous. Um, I should start by giving my, my disclaimer, which is that the views that I represent are my own views and not necessarily those of the Commission or my fellow commissioners. Indeed. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of your career certainly is the interest that you have and your background in economics uh, of essentially providing more uh, ability to for the markets to operate more effectively and maybe in some respects self-regulate to that extent. Um, you have famously proposed a uh, token safe harbor I'm sure you've received enormous correspondence and feedback and comments from all corners of that particular issue, I'm sure. Would you care to give us some further thoughts on that? I have received a lot of feedback and it's, it's been really gratifying that people have taken it seriously and have, um, have gotten back to me. There's been good and there's been bad. Um, some people have, have worried that it would sort of spark another 2017 style ICO boom um, without substance, but with a lot of people just trying to get a lot of money um, and and do do whatever they want with that money. And I think other people have seen that, no, the goal of the proposal is actually to try to prevent that type of thing from happening and to encourage people who have legitimate projects to really raise their hands and say, we're trying to build a project. We want to make a bunch of disclosures about what we're trying to do and um, we want to make sure that that anyone who's buying the tokens knows exactly what they're getting into they know who the development team is they know what the plans are they know um, how many tokens they're going to be out there and so they have assurances and there's this timeline the three-year timeline that the safe harbor 
would afford people to, to develop the token networks to a point of functionality or decentralization. Um, and that, I think, holds people's feet to the fire. And, and so we've gotten positive feedback on that, too, that that does give people the time they need to build a network, but also suggests that you're not going to start taking advantage of the safe harbor until you're somewhat down the road because you do have that timeline at the end. Um, some people have suggested that we need to think a little bit more about how we can build in um, even more protections for the token purchasers. And so that's something that I'm thinking about now. When we look at uh, token offerings, issuer transactions and non-issuer transactions, uh, we know that jurisdictions around the world are all developing paradigms of disclosure, paradigms of regulation. Uh, certainly one of the things that the incipient nature of this market and the incipient nature of the uh, items that will be traded, these blockchain items, do you have any thoughts as to how we can make these markets operate efficiently with relatively low transaction and compliance costs? Uh, we all know that there will be potentially, as we used to say, a race to the bottom. And we worry about that kind of thing. But perhaps you can Matt, give your perspective as to how you think this will evolve. Well, I think the race to the bottom is something that we should be concerned about. Um, but that's all the more reason for a jurisdiction like the United States to try to develop a workable framework um, that allows people to come here to avail themselves of, of our markets um, and, and to work within the context in the U.S. because we have a, an established system here, right? And so... Um, we have the rule of law here. So I think from that perspective, one thing we can do is to is to do a better job on providing regulatory clarity so that more people want to be here. Um, but I do think that we should remember, too, that one piece of this technology and of this movement is the is the notion that you've got a lot of participation from people across the community. And so there can be um, some discipline, as you said, market discipline, but I think also community discipline, right? A lot of these, these projects are set up in a way to ensure that you have um, active participation by people and that people are, things are transparent, so people are all watching what, what happens and they can, um, they can exercise discipline and they can change the rules. If they, if they can come to a consensus, they can change the rules. So I think those things are valuable as well, as, as long as we have this, you know, they're operating within this, this broad framework, which um, establishes the rules, and then they, they can figure out within that the, the rules that they want to have for their particular networks. It would seem that perfect markets is, are, is the goal here, to achieve a perfect market with perfect information, low-cost transaction costs, all the good things that all of us as consumers in other product markets want to see. And I would think that you're looking at these issues in a very sophisticated way, knowing full well, as we all do, that there are many bad actors out there. And we've got to be cautious about them because the reputation of any market can be destroyed by just a few headlines and a few bad actors and the dollars and such that are involved. Do you have any thoughts on collaborating uh, with the industry and others to prevent these bad actors or otherwise putting in some safeguards? Well, that's certainly something that we worry about. And I think when you have anything like crypto that gets a lot of attention in the media, um, you get a group of people who says, oh, this is perfect. This is I'm going to take advantage of this phenomenon um, to steal people's money. And we see that going on now with COVID. Um, people are saying, oh, I have the cure for COVID, I have tests for COVID, all kinds of all kinds of things. And companies that were doing crypto before think, oh, now we can pivot. Um, companies, I put in quotes, right? Um, now we can pivot and we can do something on, uh, on COVID. And so one thing that we all need to do is we ourselves and we need to urge our friends and neighbors to be very cautious when they buy anything, um, especially when they're being told this is the deal of the century and if you miss it, you're, you're going to miss out on your chance to become rich right. overnight. Sure. Um, 
So I think that's one piece of it, but I, I do think another piece of it is is we do bring enforcement actions, and and we bring lots of enforcement actions against um, people for for who engage in fraud, no matter what they call it, and that's important. But to your point, the community does have a role to play. The industry has a role to play. When you see bad actors, don't just wait for us to find find them. Tell us about them. We have a tips, complaints, and referrals page on our website. Um, and if people see things that don't look right, send us a, a tip, complaint, or referral. We call them TCRs. Um, we have a process for going through all of those and trying to triage and figure out uh, what we need to follow up on. So don't hide it from us because I think, to your point, it works in all of our interests if the bad actors are singled out and dealt with rather than, you know, and otherwise it colors the whole industry. Well said, and I, I applaud your good efforts. I think these are the kind of things that are needed, especially in a nascent market where mm -hmm. rules and norms have not yet been established and obviously a foundation for that market is certainly something that's going to aid capital formation. It'll help smaller companies, smaller businesses, the entrepreneurs, all of these folks benefit in addition to the big guys as well. Do you see any real uh, innovations with regard to a self-regulatory organization and their role in these kind of matters? Well, we've definitely talked to a lot of people who are interested in, in developing some sort of self-regulatory self organization. And so there are a number of efforts underway um, by people to sort of use self-regulation for different pieces of, of the industry. Um, and I think that's a very healthy trend. Uh, I think a lot of people did see a lot of bad activity and they said, all right, let's get together with other legitimate actors and let's set some ground rules um, for what, you know, what you should look for, what, what is, um, what's good, what are red flags, what's good activity, what's bad activity. And so I think we'll, we'll see what happens with those efforts, um, which ones sort of take off and which ones don't, but I think it is a really important and healthy thing. Now, as a securities regulator, um, we've had self-regulation a lot. There's been a lot of it in this, in this space. Some of it ends up being kind of quasi-governmental regulation. And so I, I would urge people who really want a self-regulatory approach to not assume that if you set up a self-regulatory system, we as the government need to adopt your system. Um, you know, it's something that you can develop, that you can operate, and I think it's a stronger system if you don't then say to the government, okay, now you adopt whatever rules we set as your own rules. Um, that's one model, and, and that has has worked to some degree in the securities industry, but it may not be the model that you want to adopt. So I think you should think carefully about how you design your self-regulatory system. Um, certainly one of the more fascinating aspects of cryptocurrency, and certainly think I think them something that strikes to the heart of the Securities and Exchange Commission is its role in capital formation. And all of us, I think, uh, appreciate the great work that you have brought to the commission, your perspective, your books. Uh, I can say that truly you have a, a perspective that is unique, I think, historically among commissioners of the SEC. You've, you bring a very fresh and a very deep and understanding of these issues that likely never before had been quite addressed in, with such depth. How do you see cryptocurrency uh, providing a, a real benefit in capital formation to the U.S. economy. And that, I think, is, is, to me, in my mind, is a central concern because capital formation is truly the, the key to job creation, economic prosperity, all the good things. In fact, your colleague, uh, former Commissioner Jackson, even mentioned that his parents had saved up for college. And because of the effectiveness of our capital markets, he was able to go to school. And I, w I was touched by that, by that statement he made. Perhaps, and I think both of us need to talk about this, but tell me more of your thoughts on this. Well, I mean, I, the, the, the way you laid it out is really important. That is why I wanted to come to the commission, because I believe in the power of our capital markets to transform people's lives. 
And um, so when I came, I didn't know that crypto would be an issue that I would spend as much time on as I have. Um, really what my concern is, is to make sure that our regulatory structure is flexible enough to accommodate innovation, whatever direction that comes from. Um, and, I, and I think that crypto is an interesting, um, it's an interesting technology that will allow some really fundamental changes in the way people interact with each other and the way people build things together um, in a way that's, that's a bit different from the traditional corporate form. Um, and I think that's really attractive to a lot of people who are who are drawn to this idea of collaborating with people from all over the world and collaborating in a way where everyone has a say in, in, in how the project moves forward. And so I think that can be really valuable. Um, crypto has been a way for people to raise capital. I urge people to remember that when you raise capital, no matter how you raise capital, if you're raising it to build an enterprise, you have to think about the interaction with those securities laws. Um, I, I think that sometimes when, you know, sometimes the line has been blurred between what capital formation is and what just selling tokens, um, which I think is a little bit of a different, um, you know, selling tokens to build a network to get the network effects going, that may be a different, a different consideration, set of considerations for us, and that's why I've, advocated for a safe harbor to allow us to kind of separate those out and say, okay, if you're, if you're trying to build a functional network, that's one thing. If you're actually trying to raise money, um, I think blockchain technology, crypto can be an effective way to do it, but then you better make sure that you're complying with our, our securities offering rules. How do you see the concept of restricted securities, which is somewhat unique? In, in the world. The United States has this concept of restricted securities, unregistered securities as they're properly called. How do you see that concept being applied uh, to cryptocurrency and capital transactions or capital formation transactions? And do you think that in some ways the, the architecture of the 33 Act could be replicated with respect to capital formation activities in the cryptocurrency sphere? Well, I mean, to one degree, I would say, I don't know that we need to replicate it because the, the framework is designed to be fairly flexible. And so it's designed to accommodate all kinds of different forms of capital raising. And I think that has been a strength of our securities laws that we're not wedded to very, you know, rigid definitions, but we they're flexible enough so that when something new comes along, it can fit within that framework. Um, my concern has really been, and you know, so if you're selling, if you're selling securities and you, you sell them to just accredited investors because they're, they're, they're unregistered offerings, I mean, that should work much the same way it works with other kinds of securities. Um, I think where the, where the flexibility needs to come in and where the, the thinking about how do our rules need to change is really this idea of when you're trying to get broader participation in, in your network. Because I think people have been fairly successful thus far with raising money um, from accredited investors, as long as you limit yourself to accredited investors. And that's another issue we can talk about. I mean, I have my own concerns about the, the accredited investor framework, but I think people have figured out how to use that in connection with, um, with crypto. Do you see any uh, overarching, challenging issues of disclosure? Uh, when I think of an issuer transaction or a non-issuer transaction, the disclosure burdens are fairly clear, typically. But in this context of cryptocurrency, I can think of all sorts of interesting issues that would come up. Maybe you can see how this might evolve. I don't know. Well, I think that that too was part of the reason behind the safe harbor to say is the set of issues that a purchaser of a token is interested in the same as the set of issues that a, the purchaser of a security is interested in or are there a different set of disclosures that make more sense for that purchaser to get and so I think that's kind of the thinking is you want to know you know how many tokens are going to be out there you want to know things about the development team, which may be similar to what you'd want to know about 
someone raising money for a company. Um, but you really want to have a sense of kind of where the plan is to bring that network to fruition and those, those kinds of things. So I think it does make sense to tailor the disclosure. Now, that said, our securities disclosure laws in general are fairly flexible because they really are based on give people what's material for them to know when they buy, when they buy a security. Um, and that materiality framework, as opposed to very specific disclosures, has been quite effective. Now, there's always pressure to add specific disclosures about X, Y, or Z, so we have to be careful. But I think there's enough different, and I think other people who have looked at token offerings have said there's enough different here that maybe we take it out of our traditional securities framework and put it in this other framework. Again, if what you're doing is just using crypto but raising money for an enterprise um, the same way that you would do if you sold stock or bonds, you, you really do need to be very careful about complying with the securities laws. I'm trying to provide a route for people who have probably already raised money um, from accredited investors or so, in some other format, have built something, and then they're, they, they, want it, they want that token to be out there and to be in use. And that's where they worry that just by putting the tokens out there, they're going to be accused of running afoul of the securities laws. That's why I said, okay, let's develop a framework that works just for those tokens. So really, it's, it sounds to me as if uh, you're looking to have a framework that might be similar to the framework of continuous and integrated disclosure that we currently have in our existing security markets, a la Regulation SK and SX, and to essentially perhaps add additional disclosures to ensure that investors get all the good material information that they need to have to make an informed investment decision. Um, which really gets us into the trading markets concern that I think some people have raised. And where will these markets exist? Uh, how will they operate? Uh, and obviously market integrity is again something which, uh, if it's not preserved and protected, uh, obviously could injure the markets and the ability of issuers and others to have any ability to understand or indicate uh, capital formation and trading. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think a lot of people are thinking about how these markets will work. And, and one of the key issues for people running these markets has been, you need to tell us whether these things are securities or not securities, because if they're securities, then we, they have to trade on an exchange or an exchange-like venue, an alternative trading system that is governed by quite specific rules from the SEC. If they're not securities, then they can set up trading markets that, that don't necessarily have to comply with our, with our rules. And so one thing we need to do is provide clarity so that, so that these platforms know um, what what they need to trade like a security and what not, what can trade in other ways. But I think one thing that has been fun for me in this space is that um, people who are coming to it fresh are designing trading platforms and thinking about things in a lot of the same ways that people who run traditional securities exchanges and alternative trading systems think about them. How do we have markets that are that have integrity where the price, people can trust um, that the, the pricing is is working the way it should and and people um, aren't worried about being taken advantage of having people front run them those kinds of things and so you're you're seeing people kind of rethink a lot of the basic issues underlying our securities markets and think think about it through a fresh perspective and of course, in this area, there's the further exciting possibility, but also one that poses some, some difficult legal questions of a fully decentralized trading platform. Um, how would that work? Uh, and, and so those are challenges that I think young lawyers need to be thinking about uh, who understand the technology and thinking about how that would fit within our framework. But again, if you're trading securities, there's a whole host of rules that you have to, that your platform has to comply with. Um, and so we're, 
you know, we're thinking about that and, and we're, I think it's incumbent upon us to provide as much clarity as we can. What, uh, do you foresee any specific technological attributes that need to be uh, accomplished in order for these markets to operate effectively within the framework uh, that you envision and obviously consistent with our securities regulation otherwise? Well, I mean, I think one thing that we can we can look to is the technology poses challenges to us, but it also does pose new opportunities because you can build things into smart contracts um, that you wouldn't be able to and, and, you wouldn't be able to build it into just a, a regular security, right? So you can actually build rules right into um, the contract, and that that means that automatically the rules are complied with. So I think that's an area that I'm I'm really interested to see, um, both in connection with my safe harbor proposal, but also more generally, how will that transform the way um, the way even regulation works, right? Um, I think it raises real possibilities of, of making some regulatory compliance much easier. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of other issues that we'll have to think about. You know, we have to think about data privacy issues, those kinds of things. And so new technology enables us to, to um, do much more as regulators, but it also poses challenges for us as we think about how we can do that, but respecting people's need. Um, not to be watched all the time, for example. Um, so it's it's poses many many interesting uh, challenges. Do you foresee any real difficulties uh, in perhaps maybe changes in the extraterritorial application of U.S. securities laws, given the, the nature of the instruments that are being traded? I can foresee some serious challenges to define where. Uh, the U.S. securities laws would apply and where they would not apply. Um, there's a lot of good case law in point, but obviously this is a whole different ballgame with, with blockchain. Your thoughts? It's certainly a difficult area, and it's a difficult area even without blockchain. Um, it's a difficult area with blockchain where you've got, you know, people are, are involved from all over the place. It's really hard to block out U.S persons if you don't want them involved. Um, so it certainly is challenging for us. And I think even apart from figuring out, okay, where jurisdictionally, where do we have the legal authority to go? So once you've established, yeah, yeah, we could actually go after that because there's enough of a connection to the U.S. Then I ask the question is, of, is this a good use of our resources? Um, because we have lots of things that we can do with our enforcement resources in particular. Um, and I want to make sure that we're using those as wisely as possible. And so if we're dealing with a situation where it's a U.S. person who's gone and a U.S. investor, for example, has gone and availed, availed herself of markets outside of the United States and then something goes wrong, you know, my question I'm going to ask is, is that was that person when she was investing overseas anticipating protection from under the U.S. securities laws? If not, then that may not be how we spend our enforcement resources. Um, but you know, again, it's very facts and circumstances. So one is understanding where the law lies, and then the second thing is understanding is this is this a good use of our resources? It clearly is a scenario here. It would seem where you and your groundbreaking efforts, your ex interest and very much uh, professional devotion to economic principles and efficiencies and markets and capitalism uh, is going to bring forward, I think, truly uh, many great opportunities for innovation and probably leadership for the United States in this very vital area. Um, as we close out today's discussion, what are your general thoughts as to what the next events and next issues that need to be examined may be? Well, I appreciate those kind words. From my perspective, what we really need to do is, is just remember that innovation typically comes from outside of the government sector. We need to set up a framework that allows people with great ideas 
to spend as much time as possible thinking about those great ideas and as little time as necessary thinking about regulatory structures. So that means that we as regulators need to have clear rules um, so that people know what they can do and what they can't do and not have that they don't have to spend a lot of time um, worrying about, about that. Again, people need to comply with the rules, but we can help them by making the rules clearer. Um, and then innovation, I, I'm confident, will bloom um, and will, will happen here in the U.S. Um, as well as other places. I have to say I congratulate you on having the foresight, the perspective, and the understanding of how markets operate. And I think your insights are invaluable and your leadership is going to be critical as these markets evolve. And I want to congratulate you again on your renomination. Uh, it's a tremendous endorsement of your good work. And I think I speak on behalf of everybody. We thank you. Well, thank you so much. And I've really enjoyed our conversation. I as well. Thank you.